Now, um, we looked at um, on the, our introduction about the, uh, about the importance of the Bible and how we can get the Bible into us. And, and uh, so we, we looked at a number of things, didn't we? And if you remember, I used the hand. And I don't know if you can um, remember that, but uh, the little finger was all about the ears, yes, about receive. We need to listen to the Word of God. We receive the Word of God for every one of us. That's what you're doing this morning, listening to me. Uh, then we had using our eyes, didn't we, to read the Word of God. It's important that we read the Word of God. And then we had using our mouth and our hands, didn't we? We had to research it, to study it. Um, and we do that in our, particularly in our small groups when we talk to each other about the Bible, we study it, we ask questions of it, we use, we use a pen or a pencil to take some notes on what the scripture is saying, so we need to research it. And then uh, we, we went on to the, uh, the pointy finger, and uh, the pointy finger, anybody remember what the pointy finger is? Yes, to reflect and remember. Yes, and we use, the, what we, do we use for that? We use the mind, don't we? Yes, and the last one, which brings it all together. In other words, all of the things work together from the thumb. Uh, the thumb is always the most important out of them because obviously... Um, the, the fingers on their own are not going to be able to use it. So what is, what is the whole point of, what's the point of listening? What's the point of reading? The point of researching? The point of re reflecting and memorizing the Word of God is so that we can respond to the Word of God, so that we can apply the Word of God to our lives. So that's the goal of the 40 days of the Word of God. You will see it on your books. You will see it probably on a lot of printed material as we want you to learn the Word of God, we want you to love the Word of God, but we more than anything want you to live the Word of God in your heart and life. Last week we looked at um, how we can trust the Bible and we looked at some of the aspects of that, particularly we looked at seven points about its uh, historical accuracy, about it being scientifically accurate, and uh, we spent most of our time on that one, about it being prophetically accurate and about it having a uniformed theme from start to finish, uh, that it has God's hand on it all the way through, that Jesus confirmed it, that it has survived all the attacks that it has uh, that is undergone and is still undergoing today uh, around the world. It is still the most attacked, persecuted book, as it were, banned book in the history of humanity. But more than anything else is it has transforming power. And so it's on that point that this week I want us to look at how does the Bible transform us? How does it change us in every aspect uh, of us? And so this is what I want us to look at. And so I've got seven points for this week. And um, I just want to say, first of all, there is no other book like the Bible. Just in case you didn't catch it from last week, it is, I want to say to you, there are some good books around. In fact, there are some great books around. In fact, there are some really great books around that you can read and soak in and learn from, and some of them have stood the test of time. However, the Bible stands above all other books. It is a holy book. It is a holy book, and as Christians, we are a people of the book. The book is what we live by. It's what we set the standard in our life for. When we're referring to things in life, it is the book of all books. Now, the reason it is unlike any other book is because it has transforming power, because it has supernatural power. It has life within it more than we could ever, uh, uh, ever fully uh, explain or understand, because it is a book that has the power to change your life. So if you listen to it, you read it, you re research it, you reflect on it, uh, and you remember it, and you put it into action, it will change your life forever. So we looked at the seven reasons last week why we could trust the Bible, and so this week uh, I want us to understand 
that it's not just those great things, but it is a book that is extraordinary. It has not been written with human hands. It has been written by God. It is God's word to us. And it's amazing how many times people think the Bible contains fairy tales or it contains just a few stories or some parables. But the people that have truly read it and understand it and certainly met the writer and author of the book, it will always change your life. And for the simple reason, as we looked at uh, last week, that it is God-breathed. It is not just human ideas uh, that are in it. Yes? The Word of God is the most powerful thing in the universe. There is nothing in the universe more powerful than the Word of God. Because the word of God made everything that is created. It is the voice of God. It's when God speaks, things come into being. So there is nothing in the whole universe greater than when God speaks to us. He spoke it into existence. And he is still doing that today. So what I'm saying is, is when God speaks, things happen. Things happen when God speaks. Psalm 33 and verse 6 says this, The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. In other words, God said, Let there be light and there was. God said, Let there be and there was. Whatever he said, let there be, when he spoke, it happened. And so in other words, when I speak, very little happens. When I speak, most people do the opposite (laughs) to whatever I say. But when God speaks, something happens. There is no force in the universe that can stop the voice of God accomplishing what God wants it to accomplish. Therefore, when God speaks over your life, That which God has spoken will come to pass. It will come to pass in his time and in his way. You see, when God speaks, people come back to life. And not only did that, when God did the miracles, when he came to earth and he walked amongst us uh, as Jesus, I want to say to you that thousands and thousands of people saw his miracles. This wasn't just kind of, he did it in the corner. He did it in the back room on a Sunday morning. This was a miracle for all people, everyone that was it, that was witnesses, because the Bible says the multitudes saw his thing. I want to tell you, I don't have power like that. So if you're here this morning thinking, oh, we've got an awesome preacher, I don't want you to be too disappointed, but I want to say to you, there's no power in my words, and there's no power in your words, there is power in God's word, and it's when we get the word of God into us, when we get the voice of God speaking through us, lives are changed. From that, John 6 and verse 63 says this, The words I, which is Jesus speaking, have spoken to you as spirit and they are life. In other words, they are, have spiritual power. They have transformational power. They transform society. They transform history. They transform people. God's word is a transforming power. So if you need transformation in your life, like I do, we're in the right place. Yes, we're in the right place to hear God speak to us. You see, Hebrews 4 and verse 12 says this, the word of God is living and active. It is living and it is active. It is living, the Greek word there for alive is zeo, which we get the word zoo from. Maybe you've heard of somebody, sometimes you find a a girl's name called Zoe, which means life. Yes, it just means to live. Amen. So in other words, the word of God is living. It's alive. It's got energy in it. It's got got life in the very uh, aspects of it. And it says it is active. In other words, which the Greek word therefore is uh, energos which just means energy. In other words, the Word of God has power. 
It's alive and it has power. Power to change things. The verse goes on. It is sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates <coughs> excuse me, even to the dividing of soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and intents of the heart. In other words, this is sharper than any surgeon's knife. It can go to the very parts that a surgeon cannot reach. It can go into the very depths of your being. Yes, this isn't a chainsaw. This is more of a surgeon's scalpel when God's word touches your life. Amen. And so why do we need this life? Because we need to be changed. We need to be changed. You see, I don't know about you, but there are things in me that I think I want to see them changed. And you're looking and you're thinking, yeah, there's some things in your life we'd like to see changed. But we, if you're honest with yourself, we're all, we're all honest with ourselves, there are things in our life that we want to see changed. That things that are not right in our life, things that maybe we do and we, or things that we say or whatever it might be, there are issues in our life and we think, I want to change. But the thing is, is we would have changed if we just could have done it on our own. But the reason is we haven't done is because we need an outside power and the Word of God can change it. The Word of God can change my life and the Word of God can change your life if you allow it to work in you in each way. So today I want us to look at seven ways um, that uh, the Word of God changes us. And the first one is it recreates my life. It regenerates my life. It makes my life new. I am, the Bible calls it, born again. In other words, that's how radical it is that when we get the life of Christ, when we get the Word of God into our life, it transforms us from the inside out. It makes our life brand new. Yes, it's not just turning over a new leaf. It's completely new. It's a new life that God gives us, a whole new life. James 1 and verse 18 says this, He chose to give us birth through the Word of truth. He gives us birth Spiritual birth through his word. Yes, it's spiritual birth. It's salvation. It comes how? Through the word of God. You see, without the word of God, you cannot be saved. (coughs) It's only as you hear the word of God, accept the word of God into your life, that you can be saved. Because if it wasn't for the word of God, you wouldn't know anything about heaven. It's because of the Bible that we know about heaven. We wouldn't know about Jesus if it wasn't for the Bible being written to us. We wouldn't know how to trust him if it wasn't for the word of God. If it wasn't for the word of God, we wouldn't know that God has a plan and a purpose for each of our lives. We wouldn't know the things that we need to know if it wasn't for the word of God. I want to tell you that God is not silent. God is here. Is here now, is in our midst. Whether you're aware of that or not, is God is wanting to speak to you. In fact, He is speaking to you. The issue is whether you are going to receive it, whether you're going to accept it, whether you're going to take it on into you. I want to tell you that God today wants to reveal Himself to you, He wants you to know Him. You see, God knows you. He knows everything about you. He knows all the hairs on your head. For some of us, God has an easy time. (laughs) But he knows every intricate thing. He knows your thoughts when you lie down, when you're going to bed, when you're getting up, when you're having a conversation, when you're going having a coffee. He understands every little bit and intricate part of you. But guess what? He wants you to get to know him. What a privilege to know the creator and the sustainer of all things wants to have a relationship with you and with me. 2 Timothy 3.15, Paul told Timothy, he said, From a child you have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise unto salvation. Not just to make you wise, not just to make you make good decisions, but so that you can have salvation. 
You see, the Bible is often compared to a seed. And as you know, a seed, when a seed goes into the ground, it all depends on the ground and the soil that it goes into as to whether or not it will germinate, as to what it will produce, as to what it can be. I want to tell you, the Word of God this morning is a seed for you and for me. And every time we pick up the Word of God, every time we read the Word of God, every time we're listening to the Word of God, the seed of the, uh, of the living Word of God is coming into it. It is an imperishable seed. It's a, it's a supernatural seed. It's an invisible seed. And it's going into your hearts and into my heart and mind and life. And it's up to us as to how we receive it. How do we receive the Word of God? When He tells us to do something, when we're reading the Word of God, how we respond to it will make the change as to how much impact it has on your life. Amen. Uh, 1 Peter 1 and verse 23 says this, You have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable. In other words, eternal seed through the living and enduring Word of God. Maybe you want to circle that word living and enduring. It is a it is a living word. It's not sometimes you see we can pick our Bible up, but because it's just written down and we can read it, we can fail to understand that there's power in this. For the simple reason there's power in it is because God wrote it, because God spoke it. Yes? It's not because it's been put in print. Yes, <coughs> it's not because of the paper that it's on. It's not because of the format, but it's that we're able to, to read that and reflect on it so that it goes in, because this could be written in any number of languages. <coughs> but if it's written in any other language than English to me, I can't read it. So it's only if I can understand it, if I can do it. That's why we want to give the Bible, and that's why version is such a phenomenal app, is because uh, the, the Word of God is going out to so many different languages so that people can listen to it, they can read it, they can research it, they can reflect on it, they can remember it, they can respond to it and do it. That's what God is looking for. James chapter 1. It says how we should do it in 1 verse 21. It says, humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. It's about being humble. And one of the things I find one of the biggest issues for most of us is our pride. We, we, we will not let go of that. We think we are more than what we are. But the sooner we realize that we are what God has made us to be and what he wants for us, our intellect, our abilities, our personality, everything about us is in God's hands and determined by him. So why should I brag about something that has absolutely nothing to do with me and it's all about him? I mean, the second thing about the word of God is it can eradicate my guilt and shame. One of the things that I find with most people that they're stuck with memories of things in the past, things when people have hurt them, people have said things to them, people have done things to them, whatever it might be, stuck with hurts in their life. And as a result of that, so many people are filled with resentment or filled with bitterness. Um, they're angry with, with, uh, with people and, uh, and they are feeling shame as a result of those things. I want to say to you, God does not want you to go through life feeling guilty. He doesn't want you to go through life with resentment or with bitterness or with any of these things in your life. He wants to eradicate your guilt. He wants to totally eliminate your shame because of what he has done. 1 John 1 verse 9 says this, If we confess our sins to God, he is faithful and just to forgive us and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In other words, if we come to God, God says, I will give you a bath. I will clean you from top to bottom. You will be disinfected. Yes, you're going to have some dental from the top of your head. You're going to, oh, you might not smell very good, of course. But, uh, but you're going to be pure. You're going to be without sin. You're going to be free because he has paid the price. Now you might be thinking, yes, but okay, he might be paid for my past sins and it might be because I think, but what about tomorrow? I want to say to you, he's got that covered as well. 
He's got that in the bag as well. And I believe that's so important for us, that God, we've got to understand that God wants to get rid of the guilt in our life. Romans 8 says, there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. In other words, not, God's not here to punish us. He wants to liberate us, yes? Because Jesus took our punishment on the cross, yes? Every, every aspect of our sin, the things that we think wrong, the things that we do wrong, whatever it is in attitudes that we have, God wants to cleanse us. Ephesians 5 says this, Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her to make her holy, cleansing her by the washing with water through the word. And how's it going to be done? Through the word. Amen. So in other words, when we get the word of God and we take the word of God in and we get in the devotional and we're reading it and we're, we're thinking about it like this last week, we've been pondering on the word of God and we're just trying to get the word of God into us. What does it do? It is washing us. It is making us clean. It is doing a work in, in our lives as we do that. I think that's fantastic, isn't it? To know that that's the kind of God that he has, that he wants to cleanse us from all the dirt and all the grime, all the sin in our life. He makes us clean from the inside out. John 15 and verse 3 says this, you are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. We're already clean because of the word. That's the power of the word. It makes you clean. So the word of God can recreate your life. It can eradicate your guilt. And thirdly, it activates your faith. Yes? Now, I find that most people are not confident. Most people um, struggle with, uh, with confidence. They're not courageous. They're not brave. Um, you know, most people are afraid to take risks or they're afraid of failure, afraid of what maybe other people might think or say and struggle with those kind of things. But Romans 10 shows us that faith is word activated. It says faith comes from hearing the message and the message is heard through the word of Christ. In other words, God's word increases your faith. If you want your faith to increase, you want to believe God for more, you get into the word of God and it will increase your word. You see, what I find is that over the years, as I read the promises of God, the hundreds and the thousands of promises of the Word of God, it builds my faith. It increases my expectation. So to give you a, 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 an example, when I first, Kath and I first came to, uh, to, to Stockton, and we were, we were then on um, uh, Skinner Street, and um, and. We came. I want to say to you, I inherited a church that I knew that God had called me to, but I knew that actually, if it was in the natural, I was the wrong guy for the job. Because I'm a fighter. And I remember one of the meetings there, we had all the youth, and they decided to turn their back on me. Yes? And they decided to go out and drink the pop and get on with whatever they're doing. And then they turned over the communion table and they did all things. And then, I, 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 you know, and I, it didn't matter what, what, uh, what it was. I want to say to you that we had problems. But I'll tell you what it stood was when the Word of God. The Word of God said, I've called you to this place. I've called you to this people. And you've got to stay strong. Uh, we had problems with our, with our, with our leadership. Um, the leadership that we had. And um, I asked them all to, to resign. And, um, and uh, my all intention at the time was I just felt God had said to me that they need to know that they are chosen by me. And uh, I felt it was a thing that they needed to understand that actually I wanted them. But of course, they responded very negatively to this and God worked his plan. They left one at a time. So one left and all the others thought, oh, well, it's only so-and-so. And then another one left and they were, oh, it's only so-and-so. And then somebody else left and so-and-so. But then when they'd left they then started to realize they had no influence, and so they started to write letters to everybody in the church, yes, about how wrong I was and what I was doing was not right, and this was the vision of the church, and I should be doing this and other. And as I was reading my Bible, I was reading through Nehemiah. 
Now, I didn't plan Nehemiah. I just happened to be reading Nehemiah. And as I read Nehemiah, Nehemiah was like, God spoke to me everything they were going to do. This letter they were going to do, how they were going to confront me, that they were going to send me another letter, what would be in the letter. Everything was in it. So although inside I was kind of quite fearful and thinking, well, that's you out of a job, Jonathan. They're all going to kind of, you know. But I found that when I went on a Sunday morning and I explained to them that the people understood, they read the letters and they said to them, we don't agree with that. I want to tell you that's a God thing. But the confidence came for me from the word of God. If God speaks to you, it changes everything. That's why in this next 40 days, I don't want you to get a hold of Jonathan and the things that he's done. I want you to get into the Word of God and hear God for yourself. Because if you will hear for God and the Scripture comes to you, I tell you, you can stand it, doesn't matter what anybody else says. When I went to Bible college, I went because I had a promise from God for that time to go. I had a different promise to many of the others that were in there. Though nobody else seemed to have the one that I had. Do you think that's odd? No, with God, because he gives each of us what we need. And so when things were tough and I wanted to leave and I wanted to get out of the place, he was like, come back again, Lord, you brought me here. You've got to stand on the promises of God. And when God gives you something, it will come to pass. It will come to pass, though, in his time, not your time. He's got all your life to make the promises that he has put over your life come to pass. But we want it now. We want it immediately. But God doesn't. You see, I always think of Joshua. God promised him the land. But when he promised him the land, he knew he was going to have all this land that God was giving him. (coughs) But God didn't give him it all at once. Step by step, fight by fight, city by city, obstacle by obstacle. And as you do that, God just does what you need. Now, I don't know if you're like me, but I don't want to just know the next step. I want to know way down the line. So when God says to me, I want you to do so-and-so, I'm thinking, great God, okay, but, but, but where's that going to lead? I want to know 20 years from now, where's that going to be? Now, I don't know about you, but I've at times tried to outweigh God. Unfortunately, I've realised he's got more time than I have. <laughs> so I, I think I'm on a bit of a loser here. <laughs> Uh, I'm running out of time fast and he's, yeah, take your time, Jonathan, whenever, you, whenever you're ready, I'm ready. And so when you get in the word of God, it changes you, amen? And he wants it to do into you. He wants to bless you. He has got promises for your life, for your family, for this church. He's got, for this community, for this land, he has got things that he is speaking over us and he wants to do it, but he's going to do it step by step. He's going to do it little by little. He's going to do it in his time, in his way. And we've just got to respond to that. So when we get in the Word of God, it gives us confidence. Yes, it increases our faith to believe God for bigger things. Fourthly, the Bible is able to stimulate your growth. Yes, it stimulates. Acts chapter 20, Paul is saying this as he is leaving the city of Ephesus. It's probably... The last time, he knows he's not, he's not going to see these people again. And so these are the words, his last words to these people that he wants to leave them with, them with. And he says, I commit you to God and to the word of his grace, which can build you up and give you an inheritance among all those who are sanctified. What does that mean, give you an inheritance among all who are sanctified? I want to tell you, when you've got an inheritance, it's something that is rightfully yours. So in other words, let's just imagine for a moment that you are a son or a daughter of Elon Musk. We're dreaming now, aren't we? We're in the land of dreams, yes, if only. Yes, <clears throat> But if, if 
you were in that. Now, let's just say Elon Musk died. Not, we don't want him to die, okay? But we're just saying, you're his thing, and he's your dad, and you die, right? Would you think, because you are now then, as hair, entitled to everything that Elon Musk has? It's rightfully yours. But can you imagine that if that's all rightfully yours and you kind of never take advantage of it, never use it, never refer to it, never kind of uh, respond to it, it's a waste of time, isn't it? And that's what it is with the Word of God. The Word of God wants to say, you've got an inheritance. You've got an inheritance in this life, in some of the things that God wants to do into you, with you and your children, your children's children. He wants to do something. He's wanting to build something in you. And he wants it, but he wants it for eternity. Because God has got the long view. He's not looking at the short term things, yes? He's always saying to you that if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, if you're a believer, if you're a practiser, if you're not just uh, reading the word, but you're loving the word, you're learning the word and you're living the word, I want to say to you, you are entitled to everything that God has. God is going to give us an inheritance. I think that's phenomenal, isn't it? As a belonger, as a believer, as a beholder of the things of God, because there are family privileges. Now, of course, there are family responsibilities. Now, we usually want those, do we? Yes, we want all the kind of benefits, but we don't want the battles that come with it and all the stuff that we've got to do. But if you're in a spiritual family, you defend that family. You want, you're, you're backing that family. You're going for that family. It's not, you know, one of the things that I find most frustrating is when I hear people talking about someone else in a negative way. And I know we all do it at times, but what I'm saying is, is when we do that, we are hurting the body of Christ. So it's keen for us that we think about our word, that it reflects the word. Amen? Are you with me? You've gone quiet. <laughs> 2 Timothy 3 says this, All scripture is God-breathed and is useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting and training in righteousness, so that, yes, so that, here's the purpose of the Bible, and you know Rick has talked about this, so that the man or woman of God may be thoroughly equipped to do the odd thing. To do maybe odd thing every now and again. To do something maybe once in my lifetime. To do every good work. In other words, the purpose of the Bible is to help us to live for the purpose of God. It's to thoroughly equip us. It wants to equip us for God's work. Yes, and uh, we need to understand that. So the Bible does four things. It teaches, it rebukes, it corrects, and it trains. So teaching, in other words, is showing, God showing us the path we should be on. Rebuking is God showing us the way we got off the path and we're not on the right path any longer. Correcting is God saying, but this is how to get onto the right path again. And training is how to stay on the right path. And so that's important for us, that God shows us the path, and he rebukes us when we stray from the path, but he co lovingly corrects us so that we can get back on the path, and then he shows us and trains us so that we can stay on the path. And it's his path. And that's what really matters. So the Bible recreates our life, it eradicates guilt, it activates our faith and stimulates our growth. And fifthly, the Bible illuminates our mind. In other words, it turns the light on in our mind of understanding. Psalm 119 verse 130 says, understanding your word brings light to the minds of ordinary people like Jonathan. No, I didn't say that last bit, but well, you put your name there, yes? Ordinary people, yes? The word of God brings light to ordinary people. He wants to lighten our minds. He wants to have a fresh perspective, a fresh understanding so that we've got light on and not darkness in our lives. Light up our minds so that we know what the next step is, what the truth is of what God wants for us, how to handle our feelings, yes? How to handle relationships, and so he wants to turn them on. Psalm 119, verse 99 uh, says this. You may find that the slide's a little bit out of order here. Apologies for that. Uh, but Psalm 119, 
verse 99 says, I have more insight than all of my teachers, for I meditate on your statutes. Now, I don't know if you've noticed, but there's a lot of verses in Psalm 119 that I quote and that are quoted in the things. In fact, if you're on your memory verse, if you do your memory verses, uh, three out of the six are, are um, Psalms, aren't they? Yes? And uh, so it's, uh, it, 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 it is, it, for the simple reason, it's a book all about the Bible, about the Word of God. That's what it talks about from start uh, to finish. And so meditation is key for the light to be turned on. When we think and we ponder the Word of God in our life, or as we've done this week, pronounced it. Yes, we've talked it through, we've shared it out loud, we've thought about it and meditated upon it. In that. Psalm 119 verse 105 says this, your word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. He turns, up, uh, turns on the light so that we can have direction in life. If you want to know God's will and plan for your life, get into the word because the word of God will light your path for, uh, for him. Amen? So I think that's so important. So Psalm 119, verse 18, which of course is our memory verse for this, uh, for this week. And I understand the youth are going to come up and, um, and do that in a moment. Um, but that is, is, says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things written in your law. Open my that I may see wonderful things written in your law. Amen. What is the law? The law is the word of God. Uh, it's uh, synonymous with, uh, with statutes and commands and, and, and just the word of God is in there. And uh, often the first five books of the, of the Bible were referred to as the law, the, 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 the Torah. So God wants to get the word of God into us and we need to say, keep, well, we need to pray um, for God to enlighten us in that. Sixthly, it elevates our mood. This might think it like a strange one, but whenever you get discouraged, you don't need a coffee break. You need a word break. So instead of going for a coffee and talking despondently to somebody else and then they're getting despondent, why don't you go encourage yourself and lift your mood by getting into the word of God because it promises to encourage you from that. Yes, now do I know that? Well, Romans 15 and verse 4 says this, everything, everything, not just some things, but everything that was written in the past, that's the Bible, was written to teach us so that through endurance and the encouragement of the scriptures, we might be depressed. No, so we might have Hope. Hope is one of the most powerful things in the world. To have hope. Yes? Without hope, you get desperate, despondent, discouraged, and every other D that <laughs> kind of. So that we need to understand that. We need to understand that the Word of God promises that it would encourage us because it will give us hope. You can go through the Bible and wherever you start, you see hope. You see somebody going through some difficult times and then you see God bring them through it. You see in them go through that other difficult time and you see God bring them through. And you think, okay, I'm going through a difficult time, but God's going to bring me through it. Amen? So he is going to encourage us uh, with that. Amen? So that's fantastic. So anyway, this week in your small groups, Rick is going to teach on the four essentials for a good, quiet time, yes? And now at first, when I, uh, I heard him say that, I thought it was just for the ladies. Good, quiet, oh, sorry, okay, okay, okay. Yeah, I know it was a bit, uh, bit deep for you, that one, wasn't it, anyway? Um, but anyway, he's going to give you four essentials for a good, quiet time. In other words, time in the presence of God, in the Word of God, and he's going to give you six steps on how to do it. So that's what you're going to look at this week uh, in that. Psalm 119 verse 14 says this in the message. You're my place of quiet retreat. I wait for your word to renew me. God's word will renew us. That's what it promises to do. It will encourage us. It will give us hope. So if you're discouraged, you know what that means, don't you? 
It means you're not in the word. So if I see you discouraged and your head's down and all oh, things are right, oh, pastor, pastor, what does it mean? It means you're neglecting the precious word of God. You get into this and it'll lift your spirit. You'll come in here on a Sunday morning bouncing. You'll be going, Jonathan, I've got to preach this morning. It's in me. <laughs> well, if you do do that, they might let you as well. And, uh, and then I'll be out of a job. Can you imagine, though, if we came into the house of God, having already spent time in the word of God, how we would come with a different response so that when we're praising, we're not, we're not waiting for the song to go, I lift my hands. But actually, we come in and we're going, oh, come on, get going. Why are we waiting to start the service? Come on. Let's get, do you know what I'm trying to say? We, there's an excitement, there's a passion. And that comes not through Jonathan, that comes through the word of God. He is the one who wants uh, to recreate our life, to give us a new life, to give us a fresh start, to er eradicate our guilt, to activate our faith, to stimulate our growth, illuminate our mind, and elevate our mood, and one more, liberate our potential. Woo. Liberate our potential. I want to say this to you. Only your creator knows your full potential. Not your husband, not your wife, not your parents, not your children, not your boss at work, not your neighbours. Nobody else knows your potential except the one who created you. And he created you uh, with such enormous potential within us that we don't tap into most of what God has given us. But God wants us to tap into it and we can only know that and release that potential as we get into the Word of God when it does all the things that enable us to be what God wants us to be when we spend time in the Word of God. Most people are living for what other people expect of them, their expectations. Oh, you're thinking, you know, you have low expectations. I want to say to you, God does not have low expectations for your life. He doesn't have just the run of the mill in your life. He doesn't have it that you will just get up every day and you'll have some breakfast and you'll have a happy Daniel plan breakfast. His plan for you is not just that you would go at lunchtime and you would break the Daniel plan and have fish and chips. His plan for you is not all the, all the intricacies. They're all maybe part of it that you would say, I want to honour God with my body and so therefore I'm not going to have fish and chips. But what I'm saying is, is that it's so important that we understand that God knows our potential physically, mentally, emotionally, spiritually, ministry-wise, what we can do. And unfortunately, it's only the few that so often that believe the word, they're in the word, receive the word, and listening to the word, and so they receive it and they say, let's believe God for this. I want to say to you, you can be the only one who reads and receives and get, get researches and gets it in and applies the word of God you might be the only one in your family, but I want to tell you, you will be blessed. And your family will be blessed because you will be of greater potential in your family. You will be greater than you are now. You will be more able to speak the right words and, and say the right thing and do the right thing so that when your wife says to you, Jonathan, would you like to? Instead of saying, no, I wouldn't like to. I will, but I don't want to, okay? Instead, you go, oh, yes, love. She's not here today, so just don't let her know, okay? <laughs> this is between me and you, all right? <laughs> so I don't want to go now, oh, well, Jonathan, yeah. Anyway, but you get the plan because you're re renewed, you're recreated, you're a new person. You're not thinking as you would have said. John 8, 31 says this. If you continue in my word, then you are truly, my, uh, truly disciples of mine and you will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? And as I said the other week, a lot of universities have that on, but they don't quote the first part of it. It is so important for us. So let me summarize. Would you like to have your life recreated your guilt eradicated, your faith activated, your growth stimulated, your mind illuminated, your mood elevated, and your potential liberated. I do. <laughs> I do. 
So if we're interested in that, we need to get into the Word of God and we need to gain them benefits. So I just want to quickly go through things, three things that will help you. Now we're going to obviously unpack this a lot through these next few weeks uh, in your small groups and, and Sundays. But I want you to do three things. You've got to learn it, you've got to accept it, and you've got to do it are the three things you've got to do, and I hope you will get it. You've got to learn it. Yes, you, can, you can't do something about what you've not learned. Yes? So Mark 12, 24 says there, your trouble is that you don't know the Scriptures. Yeah, it's talking to the Pharisees. You think, well, out of all the people, surely they know the Scriptures. But you see, the, the issue is this, and just stay with me a little bit, is your problem is not your problem. You say, well, that doesn't make sense, Jonathan, because if it's my problem, it's my problem. But actually, it's not. You see, your problem is never the problem. The problem is how you respond to the problem. It's your response every time. That's why you can have two people identically in the same situation, go through the same thing, yes, and they both respond differently. It's not the problem that is the problem. The problem is the heart. The problem is in the mind and how we're responding to this. One overcomes, one fails. One succeeds and one doesn't. Why? Because it's always about response. And every problem is an opportunity. It's an opportunity for growth. It's an opportunity for prayer. It's an opportunity to trust God more. It's an opportunity to develop your character. It's an opportunity to see God do a miracle. The problem is not your circumstances. The problem is your response. Now, I don't know about you, but we typically have the wrong response. That's our natural way to do it. So Proverbs 14 verse 12 says this, there's a way that seems right to men and women, I'll add that, but it always ends in death. In fact, usually I find that if I want to know what God's will is, I think to myself, well, what would I respond to? And then think, it's obviously the opposite. In other words, if somebody was to, uh, to, to talk about me in a negative way, hurt me, my feelings, I get hurt very quickly. So if somebody hurts my feelings, what would be my natural response? You think about it, somebody says something to you, yes, yeah, somebody curses you or somebody slaps you or kicks you or whatever it might be, what is your natural response? Is it to forgive? Is it to do good? Is it, no, it's not. So what I'm saying is often our natural response is the opposite to what God wants us to do. And it's quite insightful, I think, that, that for us. Because the problem is, is if we hold a grudge, it holds us. And we're the only one that actually suffers pain as a result of this. So we like to think that we've got it all together. And we think that we can fake it till we make it and that people will just see us as we are. But actually, the Bible says, it's not about you trying to be something you're not. Just be humble, and be who God has made you to be. Don't try to impress. Secondly, you've got to accept it. You've got to accept its authority in your life. Yes, we did a little about this at the first week when we, we looked at that. Um, and we've got to understand, and this is where you've got to approach the Bible. And if you approach it like this, it will transform the way that you approach it. And that is... If it's the authority in your life, not just a authority, but the authority in your life, then you are going to respond to it differently. So the bits that you don't understand, you're going to say, God, I don't understand this, but I'm going to do it. Lord, you see this bit, I don't like it, but I'm going to do it. Lord, you see this bit here that's kind of, I really don't think that should be in there, but it is, Lord, so I'm going to trust you for it. That's the difference in having it as an authority in our life. If it's your authority, it dictates in your life and you accept it because God has said it. I want to tell you, if I had to understand everything that God said to me and asked me to do, you'd never do uh, very little, would you? You wouldn't do much. But it's so important for us to understand that, that we're not God and he is 
with us. So we might not like it, we might not agree with it, it might not be popular, it might not be politically incorrect, it might be politically incorrect, it may be hard to do, you may think it's impossible, but if it's your authority in life, you're still going to accept it and do what it says. 1 Thessalonians 2 verse 13 says this, when you receive the word of God, which you heard from us, you accepted it, not as the word of men, not as the word of Jonathan, but as it actually is, the word of God, which is at work in you who believe. It's for believers. It's for believers. So you've got to believe it. You've got to accept it as the authority. And the third thing is you've got to act on it. And I'll just finish with this. John 13, verse 17. And if the musicians want to come and... Uh... Are the youth going or... Oh, it's the youth next, is it? Okay, okay. I've got loads of time then. John 13, verse 17 says this. Now that you know these things, you will be blessed since you know them. No? Since you know these things, now that you know these things, you will be blessed if you write them down. Memorize it. Get it in me jotter. Put it on my mirror. What does it say? Do it. If you will do it. Yes, that is what's important. That's how you get blessed. When you do it, you learn it, you accept it, and you do it. It will change your life forever. Amen. Amen.